Uh, good morning. The committee will come to order. And now I want to welcome Secretary McDonough uh, to review the VA budget request for 25 and 26. And I want to let everyone know that we're expected to recess about 10.30 uh, for the Japanese Prime Minister to address the joint session. And then we'll resume the hearing after that. But I want to thank all the witnesses for their patience when we're dealing with this situation. Um, uh, so I want to get right to it. So, you know, the President's request, uh, $369 billion for the VA fiscal year 2025. Now that's nearly 10% increase from this year. In March, Congress already appropriated the vast majority of the 2025 funding, or $295 billion. In June of last year, Congress already appropriated $24.5 billion for Toxic Exposure Fund for 2025. So, we are here today considering the remaining VA account for 2025 and the advance request for 2026. Congress has all, always, uh, I want to say this real clear, Congress has always prioritized veterans and met VA needs. In fact, for the most part, the department already has received their funding for FY 2025. And I don't want to hear any more baseline rumors that, and scare tactics that cut about Congress cutting off support for veterans like we heard last year. It is disrespectful to the men and women who have served our great nation to spread lies in an attempt to score political points. And I won't, we won't do it, we can't. I want to have a serious conversation about how VA is managing their taxpayer dollars that Congress provides. There is a real problem here. Somehow, despite the nearly $17 billion increase this year and $33 billion requested for next year, the second largest federal agency can barely keep its lights on. Hiring has been cut back or frozen. The healthcare workforce is shrinking by 10,000 positions. Construction to, modernization, to modernize the VA facilities has flatlined to only two major projects. IT investments have been cut by 99%. Some existing projects barely have enough funding to continue, and new projects are off the table. The White House seems to be shortchanging many of the priorities that, the pres that President Biden presents in his own budget, and many of our priorities as well. The overall request increase is large, but a lot of the money seems to be in the wrong places. The simple explanation is that VA used the, in, the enhanced pay authority that Congress provided in the PACT Act and elsewhere to sp spend themselves into a deficit in many VA offices. They can no longer afford the employees they have now, much less recruit talented new ones. It is the opposite of what Congress intended when we provided these authorities. I absolutely support the PACT Act but VA implementation of parts of the law is getting very confusing. We're hearing from some members' offices that the VA medical centers don't even understand the new eligibility criteria for veterans. And the whole VA budget is reliant on gimmicks that get more and more complicated every year. I'm talking about transfers, carryovers, transformation funds, unfunded requirements, doing away with a second bite for health care, and a mandatory construction account that doesn't exist. And yes, despite Congress's intent, VA is using toxic exposure funds as another budget gimmick. They are shifting regular expenses out of the baseline budget, dumping them in the toxic exposure fund. Like, like it or not, 40% of the toxic exposure funds is community care. The VA budget simply does not have to be this complicated, especially because unlike the federal agencies, Congress always found ways to provide VA. Prioritize VA. We always have, and I'm confident that we always will. I have faith in the Appropriations Committee to sort out the VA's accounts. We have to do our part too, as the authorizing committee. I want effective, programs and realistic estimates. I want the dollars to actually benefit the veterans, family members, and survivors. And we always have to stand guard against growth in the bureaucracy. We have in front of us one of the most confusing VA budgets I've ever seen. 
Somehow, a 10% overall increase contains a lot of cuts in a lot of different areas that frankly don't make sense. But I am committed to protecting health care and benefits, and I hope we will work together to do that. With that, I want to thank Secretary McDonough uh, and, the represent, uh, and his representatives, uh, and the representatives of DAV, PVA, and VFW, uh, who will also be testifying on the second panel. And with that, Ranking Member, I now recognize you for your opening statement. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Today, we welcome Secretary McDonough and Veterans Service Organization representatives of the Independent Budget to discuss the Department of Veterans Affairs budget request for fiscal year 2025. Budgets reflect our priorities. That is true in how we spend our money and our time. This year's request from the, president's, uh, from the president of, three, of $369.3 billion in funding for the Department of Veterans Affairs is a 10% increase over fiscal year 2024. It is no secret that the VA's budget has grown significantly since the start of the global war on terror. But this is a feature, not a bug. President Biden's budget for FY 2025 illustrates a key pillar of his unity agenda to support veterans. This year's requested increase reflects the president uh, upholding promises made to those who have served since 9-11 and is a step in the right direction to care for our aging Vietnam veterans. During the last year, the PACT Act has expanded VA healthcare and benefits to millions of veterans exposed to toxins and other hazards. VA has approved more than 862,000 PACT Act-related claims, and more than 400,000 veterans have newly enrolled in VA healthcare. Last year, VA also permanently housed over 45,000 homeless veterans, provided suicide prevention and emergency care for over 50,000 veterans thanks to the Compact Act, expanded services for veterans at risk of suicide, delivered an all-time yearly record number of health care appointments, and so much more. Now, this is just the start of what we can accomplish with a well-funded VA. However, we know that uh, Republicans have a different vision for VA. Their chosen presidential candidate's plan, as laid out in his Project 2025 proposal, will mean the end of VA as we know it. It means a spoil system that doles out contracts to corporate interests, and it means the privatization of VA health care. Let me repeat that. It means the privatization of VA healthcare. When VA does well, it does really well. VA outperforms the private healthcare sector in terms of quality and patient satisfaction. But my Republican colleagues continually push a narrative of supposed failure that is not based in reality and is not based on the reality of many veterans. Just recently, a Vietnam veteran who receives his care at VA let me know how much he values it in response to congressional efforts to erose, erode that direct care, the veteran told me, don't let them mess it up. As such, I'm alarmed to observe the growth in community care budget since the Trump administration implemented new access standards in, 2020, in 2019. VA's healthcare budget is out of balance. And rather than directing billions of dollars to the community, we must provide VA with the necessary resources and staffing to ensure that direct care is robust, modern, and meeting veterans where they are. We need to continue to do more to house our homeless veterans and continue to provide VA the ability to hire more staff to meet the demands of more veterans using VA healthcare and benefits. Community care is more expensive than direct care. And if we were truly concerned about the cost and fiscal responsibility, we would invest more in direct care as it is less expensive and most effective for veterans. Now, this is my 12th year in Congress. In my first year, we dealt with the Phoenix wait time scandal. I was part of the negotiations on the Veterans Choice Act. As part of that, we saw that Phoenix, like many other places in this country, struggled with a shortage of health care providers, both at VA and in the community. In the Choice Act, I championed a provision that increased the number of medical res residency slots at VA by 1,500 positions. This is helping to increase the supply of physicians, both at VA and the community. And this is why investing in VA is so important. I know that ramping up VA's internal capacity is not simple. 
It will take time to bring veterans back from the community and into VA care, but it is something we must do. I'm sure we'll hear today Republicans continue to be mouthpieces for extreme ideologies that amplify messaging that VA uh, health care should be privatized. And that is the direction we are headed if we do not take the time, provide the funding, or proceed with thoughtfulness to rebalance direct care and community care. I look forward to hearing from Secretary McDonough and our VSO partners today, and I yield back. Thank the, rank, thank the rank, ranking member uh, for his comments, and even so, some probably are not right, but that's all right. Secretary McDonough, uh, I'm going to swear you in now, if you would. Um, would you please stand, raise your hand, right hand, you were way ahead of that. Um, do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, and let the record reflect the witness has answered in the affirmative. And now I would like to recognize the Honorable Dennis McDonough for 10 minutes for his opening remarks. Thank you again for being here. Chairman Boss, Ranking Member Takano, thank and distinguished members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Sergeant First Class Constance Cotton served honorably in the United States Army, including in combat during the Gulf War. She's a survivor of several incidents of military sexual trauma, MST. So she shared her story of MST with pastors and with lay leaders. Eventually, she was connected to the VA in Philadelphia and its chaplain, Reverend Chris Antal, and Vet Center Counselor Renee Smith. For nearly a decade, Chaplain Antal has helped Constance heal from moral injuries, while Renee has helped her deal with post-traumatic stress. Constance lives in New Jersey, but chooses the Philadelphia VA and Vet Center for her care. She says, I like that they really understand the challenges that veterans face. She goes on, I am a walking miracle. They helped me, helped give me a sense of community again. We owe vets like Constance and all vets, including the many vets on this committee, our very best. We're fighting like hell to give them exactly that. We're delivering more care and more benefits to more veterans than at any time in VA's history. Over the course of the last year, we've enrolled over 400,000 new vets in VA healthcare, 30% more than the previous year, and an increase in each of the 50 states of this awesome republic. Over 6.5 million vets had 118 million clinical visits, 47 million in the community, 42 million at VA, 29 million via VA telehealth. The last data point bears repeating, millions of vets use VA telehealth. Now, on to benefits. We've decided over 1.9 million claims, shattering the previous year's record by 16%. We've all heard of vets' frustration with CMP exams, justifiable. But in the last year, we processed 2.4 million CMP exams, a record by nearly 30%, and took an average of 31 days to complete them. In total, we delivered $163 billion in earned benefits to over 6 million veterans and survivors, another record. And the PACT Act has opened the doors to millions of toxic exposed veterans and their survivors, bringing new generations of vets to VA healthcare and expanding benefits for many more. The PACT Act is also delivering additional benefits for vets, the GI Bill, VRNE, home ownership, survivors' pensions, and so much more. Benefits that not only improve veterans' lives, but strengthen the American economy. We still have a lot of work to do. President's proposed budget fully funds VA so we can continue doing that important work. This budget's about, also about preventing veteran suicide, ending veteran homelessness, supporting health care for women vets, modernizing our IT systems, processing benefits, and honoring vets with eternal resting places. And no single investment is more critical to veterans that we serve and VA's future than the people we hire and retain. We hired at record levels last year. 
onboarding teammates like Rose Zandel, one of VA's newest RNs. Rose spent 20 years working as a nurse in her community, but she chose to come to VA to serve vets, like her dad and her grandpa. That's the kind of deep devotion that characterizes VA clinicians. And Rose said that she's grateful for the critical skills incentive that she received, that it shows VA's commitment to supporting its employees, and that she hopes one day to retire with VA. The work of caring for the brave men and women who fight our wars and their families, survivors, and caregivers is in full swing and continues to grow. The Mission Act, COVID pandemic, and the PACT Act, all of these are products of just the last six years. And any one of them would have been monumentally challenging. Together, they've changed the healthcare landscape and the statutory basis for the work at VA. As I said, any one of those on their own would have led to monumental change. Together, they represent a seismic shift in the way veterans receive care and benefits. The way they, change, they have changed the way we do business, creating enormous opportunities for veterans and VA. And right now, we're at a critical moment for shaping and securing the future of veteran healthcare in America. So we will work to reliably offer a VA care option to every veteran, even vets who qualify for community care under the Mission Act. We want to bring as many vets as possible into our care because study after study shows that vets do better at VA. And we've made considerable progress, whether in person, via telehealth, in our community living centers, mobile medical units, elsewhere, vets can access VA care at almost every turn. What we do this year and over the next several years, building on the generosity of Congress in the last many years and the innovative hard work of VA's workforce, the best in the federal government, will determine what vets can expect from VA and how we deliver that high standard of care well into the future. This budget is the next step to, continuing, to continue delivering more care, more benefits to more vets for generations to come. So we look forward to collaborating even more effectively with you to build on what's working and to fix what's not. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the written statement of the Secretary McDonough will be entered into the hearing record uh, now we will start on questions. I now recognize myself uh, for questions. Uh, Secretary McDonough, the Fiscal Responsibility Act uh, exempted veterans' health care from any cuts. Yet that, yet that is where you've had a hiring freeze and the biggest budget problems. Can you explain why, what that's going on? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. VA's total request re represents a 10% increase over FY23. Uh, and it's comparable to FY24, as you said in your opening remarks. But let me just note a couple of things. Uh, it appears on f at first blush that uh, it represents a decrease in community care. But one of the biggest uh, changes in the last several years, partly because of your generosity over the course of many years during the pandemic, is additional funding streams. One of those is unused balances from previous years. We have been very careful uh, to in reinvest those uh, to include in medical care. Also, under the PACT Act, you overwhelmingly gave us uh, a new authority under the TEF, the Toxic Exposure Fund. So when you consider carryover and TEF, uh, in fact, community care grows. And I think as you've seen in each of your districts, community care continues to grow at a very rapid rate. So uh, the fact is that when you take the total picture, TEF, carryover, and the very generous uh, request for discretionary funding, uh, VA care grows and is sufficient to meet the challenges that we face as a, a health system. But it is true that across both non-defense and defense accounts in the discretionary, 
that the budget agreement uh, forced difficult choices. And we made those difficult choices. And we put those in black and white. And I'm here today to defend those. And to be honest with you, after having the best hiring year in 30 years at VA last year, we are well positioned to provide care. And having seen that this year's cap, look, you guys know this better than I do, those caps, it appears to me, aren't going anywhere. In which case, the prudent thing to do is to begin to make sure that we're ready to operate in that difficult budget picture. That's what this budget does. It makes hard choices, but we put them out there for you all to see. Lastly, let me just give you one story. I just was talking to our leadership in Texas yesterday. Uh, our uh, hospital CEO in San Antonio uh, had a difficult choice to make. Does she hire two GI docs that she's been looking for for three years, and she can now hire them because of the CSIs, because of more competitive hiring, and because docs want to come work at VA, because of the ability to make decisions based in the veteran's best interest, not clearing it through Blue Cross Blue Shield, okay? She made the decision to hire those two providers. That's the right decision. That's not a hiring freeze. That's a strategic choice to make sure that we have the best providers available for our vets. This budget allows that to continue, and that will continue. Okay, hopefully, uh, the next question I've got um, right now, uh, not a problem that you caused, not a problem that we caused, but there's another um, body across the rotunda that caused it. They kind of torpedoed uh, what was the uh, Infrastructure Review Commission. Yes. Uh, how are you going to maintain the health facilities and give veterans care closer to where they live and fund the community care if you can't adjust where your footprint goes? Yeah, th thanks for the question, Mr. Chairman. So let me just say right up front, because I know that uh, uh, to you and to Ms. Budzinski and to others, uh, the new facility in St. Louis is a major priority. It, is, mm -hmm. it remains our major priority. We had hoped to get uh, some funding in FY24, um, and our budget request for FY25, which was finalized before 24 was finalized. Uh, you, as you look at it, you get a sense that we had anticipated there would be some progress on that. Nevertheless, we anticipate there will be uh, funding for, F, for FY26 for St. Louis, one. Two, uh, we've instituted a strategy here on uh, our infrastructure to maximize the dollars we get, uh, and you see that in this year's uh, request with uh, major investments in uh, West LA uh, and then across the system, significant investments in minor, uh, investment, uh, in minor construction, you all raised the cap on that to $30 million, which allows us to move with much greater alacrity on new outpatient clinics to get them closer to veterans. Uh, and then we are also making sure that we're prioritizing working with our interagency partners, including the Department of Defense, which I think you've all witnessed itself is re-examining very closely its balance of care between the community and the direct care system. So we're using v, uh, VA providers in DOD facilities to get that care closer to veterans. Three good examples, uh, Shaw, Shaw Air Force Base outside Sacramento, uh, Fort Campbell in Kentucky and Tennessee, where we have a CBOC open uh, in the, uh, the Fort Hospital on Fort Campbell, and then third at the Navy uh, Medical Center in Pensacola, Florida, which uh, we opened as a site for surgery, ambulatory surgery. We will expand that to a fuller CBOC uh, for vets care later this year at no expense, no additional expense to the taxpayers for that veteran care. Those are existing facilities that allows us to provide care to veterans, as I say, at no additional infrastructure cost to the taxpayers. I'm, I'm over on time, but I do need to figure, so I'm glad you mentioned St. Louis. I hope you're going to work, we can get a commitment to work with you, you, got that. On, you got that. on making sure that's brought back yes. on. Um, there's also a quick concern that I have. Uh, we were out in the district this last week. Uh, we have uh, seen photos uh, in my constituents for foreclosed homes that VA manages. Uh, they're invest invested in, they're infested with mold, stripped uh, of appliances, uh, occupied by squatters. Uh, yesterday, VA announced the VA uh, service pub, uh, the VA 
SP, which will be buying veterans default mortgages. I'm very concerned about this, and I'm working on legislation to give veterans a better solution. The new program will create huge increases in properties a VA will own because some will be inevitably defaulted on. How are you going to manage those right quick? And then I'm going to... Yeah, uh, Chairman, thanks very much. Uh, and thanks for the heads up about what's happening in, at, at home in your district. We'll make, I'll make sure that we specifically follow up on those. Uh, fact is that our track record at VA on mortgage financing uh, is uh, best in industry. Uh, foreclosures among uh, VA mortgage holders are uh, extraordinarily rare. Uh, nevertheless, because of the tumult in the real estate market as a result of the pandemic, there are about 40,000 uh, mortgage holders whose, uh, through no fault of their own, uh, whose mortgages uh, are at risk. The VASC program, building on existing authority that we have, uh, you know, which has been over the course of the last couple of days, uh, not uniformly, because I know there's critiques of it here on the committee, we take those very seriously, but have been uh, warmly received among uh, many veterans, veterans groups, as well as uh, the mortgage industry, uh, underscores that this is the most cost-effective way to keep veterans in their house. Uh, and we think that we take that very, very seriously. Um, and we think that uh, the, the risk that VA takes on in the, in, in the event of those 40,000 mortgages is manageable because of the safeguards we built into the program, uh, because of what I anticipate will be your very aggressive oversight. Uh, and the costs, even in the extremis of any risk there, are far exceeded by the potential costs and disruption for those veterans if we don't take this step for those 40,000 cases. So uh, I know that this will be a, an issue both throughout the rest of this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I welcome that. Uh, but the one thing that I want to reassure you of is, uh, you know, we're not going to be, we're going to be an open book with you on this. We think that the oversight actually will strengthen our performance of the VAST program. But uh, we also think it's uh, both building on existing authority and a reasonable uh, investment for those 40,000 vets. Thank you. And I'm way over on time. Uh, ranking member, you were recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here, Mr. Secretary. Thank uh, you. Can you, do you agree with my assertion in my opening statement that overall direct care is less expensive uh, to deliver than care in the community? Well, look, I mean, uh, I'd say three things. One, study after study shows that the care that vets get in the direct care system uh, is, leads to higher health, uh, 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 more improved health outcomes, so better health outcomes, one. Uh, two, uh, it is true that uh, the investment that we have made over the life of VA, and look, uh, let me just underscore again my appreciation for this committee's support uh, and the entire Congress's support on bipartisan basis for historic investments in VA, including throughout the pandemic. Uh, those investments mean that uh, the unit cost per care uh, over time because of the investment in the, the infrastructure to date uh, makes VA a uh, longer term, better outcomes based uh, investment for the taxpayers. Um, and then I will say that we are witnessing a great degree of variability. And this is, a I think, a, a very real policy challenge for us, basically at VA, but also for Congress, which is it's very difficult to run a system that is both a direct care system and functionally an insurance company. There are a lot of steps that you would take in under that scenario uh, that lead you to uh, inefficiencies, uh, rob you of uh, economies of scale. Um, and so uh, as we consider the future of VA coming out of these three monumental changes, Mission Act, the Pandemic, and PACT Act, I think we want to get our hands around just how much risk we can take in uh, you, you, I call the cost in, in community care variable. It's half right. It's variable in one direction, namely up. Uh, and then the cost of the fixed care, the fixed ca cost of the direct care system, uh, that makes for a very difficult challenge for us in the years ahead. And I look forward to working with the Congress on it. 
Well, so I, my question was pretty simple. I mean, a, a, a three-part answer. In your estimation, is it? Yes. So it is less expensive to, uh, to I, I believe that care. I do, yes. So, you know, um, over the last few years, VA has delivered more care and benefits than any other, than any other time in history. I commend you and the hardworking employees at the VA for doing that and all the efforts you have gone into, implement, into implementation of the PACT Act. Uh, when VA delivers, it delivers well, and I think ensuring a balance between direct care and community care is more important than ever. Um, and that said, I wanna make sure I understand your 2025 budget request. First, you are proposing a transfer of $7.3 billion from the medical services or direct care account to the community care account in order to help cover the uh, estimated obligations of $40.9 billion for community care in FY 2025. Second, you plan to reduce the overall number of VHA employees by about 10,000 between now and the start of fiscal year 2025. Third, you are also preparing to transfer $600 million to the community care account from the medical facilities account, which covers things like VA facility management, uh, renovations and leasing, the very things that you said that it's important to invest in in order to make uh, direct care uh, really feasible. You have expressed concern throughout your time as secretary about the unsustainable trajectory of community care spending and the need for VA to rebalance resources between direct care and community care. Now, I share this concern. I wanna know how your budget reflects that. How will redirecting billions of dollars from direct care to community care and shrinking VA's workforce by 10,000 employees accomplish our shared goal of ensuring more veterans receive more of the care at VA facilities rather than in the community? Yeah, uh, fair question. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, just uh, on the 10,000 uh, FTE reduction, uh, that's not at the beginning of FY25. It, that will be at the end of FY25. That's what's envisioned in the budget. Uh, this reflects the fact that not only do we have an historically strong hiring year last year, uh, but retention is highest it's been uh, in a long time. That is a reflection again of the investments that you gave us in the PAC Tech, and I thank you all again one more time for that. Uh, CSIs, special salary, so critical skills incentives, special salary rates, uh, retention bonuses are paying uh, very well because uh, retention is up. Uh, quit rates are down. Um, the fact of the transfer of seven plus billion from the direct care into the community care account is a reflection of what we've seen in the course of the last 18 months which is a uh, robust uptake of uh, care in the community. And prudence dictates that we be ready uh, for that. That's why we ask for that, that transfer. Um, nevertheless, as I've said in my opening uh, remarks, we wanna make sure that, partly because of the, the <coughs> uh, fundamental unworkability, for example, if you take Vision 7, which is uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, uh, seven, fully 70% of vets in care in that system are drive time eligible in the first instance, meaning they qualify referral to the community uh, by virtue of drive time alone, uh, even though there's no private, there's rel uh, fewer, even fewer private providers available to them. So when we refer them into the community, they're gonna travel just as far to get the care in the community. So. In light of that, we wanna make sure that every time we have an engagement with a veteran, we make clear that the apple to the apple, if you have a referral option in the community, we have a very clear offering to the veteran for how soon and where that veteran can get care in the direct care system. We think that when given that apples to apples comparison, the veteran will choose, even when eligible for community care, to stick with us because veterans understand the positive health outcomes as well. Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, to your point, uh, the example about uh, the choices that, uh, the, the no choices that veterans have in many rural areas, uh, that being referred into the community is not really a solution because of the 
lack of uh, providers or the non-existence of providers, um, you know, this idea that uh, care in the community is the solution uh, to that veteran's um, challenge. Uh, you know, you've, you've made a very kind of, I think, uh, a, a very clear illustration of where uh, this solution really is not as a non-solution. Um, I'm curious, when, when can we expect to see a strategy, um, a plan on how you're going to rebalance and how you're going to um, uh, provide these veterans with true choices? Yeah. Um, because I see the response is not more community care for those rural veterans. I see that we need to stand up uh, providers in those communities, some maybe in conjunction with other uh, federal uh, payers. Yeah. So uh, when can we expect to see a strategy on how we're going to get our arms around uh, this explosive rise in community care? I, I, you know, I, I think it's a fair question. I think we have uh, pieces of that strategy are being implemented now. We've talked at length about those, but nevertheless, I think... Your, your request for kind of a uh, all-in strategy that lays out soup to nuts, how we'll get this done is, a, is a, a reasonable one. And we'd look forward to having that conversation with you guys over the course of uh, the next several months as uh, you're thinking about the budget picture for FY25 and beyond. Well, thank you. Uh, I hope we can see that strategy soon. And uh, I appreciate your being here. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Burke. General Berkman, you're recognized. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Sir. Great, great to see you. And you. Um, we'll get right to it because time is finite. Um, money seems to not be in some cases, but we know in the end it really is. Um, uh, I am on the budget committee this cycle and, and in charge of a task force on improper payments across the government. So, uh, you know, as chairman of that, uh, of that oversight task force is finding out I hate to say where all the pots of money are, but how the monies that have been appropriated out there, how are they being spent? So while there's some, been some progress in recent years, um, can you tell me how VA, you know, you know will continue to, to work to lower the improper payments to the greatest extent possible? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, General, for, for the question. I obviously share your concern about improper payments. I'm proud of the progress that we've made at VA on this. VA has reported a total reduction of $11.6 billion, uh, which is a 79% reduction in improper payments over the last five years. And FY23 is the lowest reported improper payments uh, at VA in nine years. Our focus going forward is on improving our testing processes to ensure that we're getting to the root cause of re, uh, any remaining improper payments and leveraging every tool available. Obviously, that's gonna, that's gonna be based on automation, on strengthening our processes, working with the committee, uh, and working with GAO, with the IG, and with industry uh, to prevent improper payments on the front end. I'll just give you one example. Uh, this is in our education programming. Uh, one of the uh, routines is a slightly different from uh, the improper payments basket, but one of the places where we had been accumulating or veterans had been accumulating uh, unknowingly debt uh, is uh, education over payments because they had stopped uh, going to class. So we've instituted a process of regular text exchange with student veterans to make sure that they are still where they uh, had planned to be so that they're not incurring debt uh, accidentally. That's the kind of testing and uh, uh, automation that we wanna make sure that we're making progress on. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, different subject, Yes. psychedelics, as you, um, I'm hoping to know, I'm the co-chair of the Psychedelic Assisted Therapies or PATH yes. Caucus along with Lou Correa uh, from California. I was happy to see the VA issue a request for applications for studies into MDMA-assisted therapy to treat PTSD in veterans, and I'm glad the budget listed these treatments as priorities. However, given the reduced funding for research and reduced healthcare workforce under the budget, how will VA prioritize research into psychedelic-assisted therapies and the, most critically, probably, the training of the therapists in these, in yep. these new uh, regimens to admit to administer the treatment so that veterans can actually 
you know, get the results uh, and, and, you know, as FDA approval moves forward. Yeah, well, thanks uh, very much for the question. The, and thank you for your support of this uh, uh, new uh, uh, tool. The, partly by listing it the way we do in the budget and mindful of uh, what appears to be fairly rapid progress from FDA, although it's obviously difficult to see inside FDA, but also because of the great hope that we hear from many veterans, including here in Congress, about these treatments, we feel duty bound to prioritize this so that we are ready when uh, FDA gives a green light so that vets don't rush into this without the support of VA uh, because there is gonna be risks if there are, is not support of VA. So the, uh, the funding levels that you talked about, the staffing levels will not impact our prioritization of this. Last point I'll make, uh, Mr. Bergman, is I do however anticipate debate about this up here, just judging by the reaction to our budget proposal. So one thing that I think I just wanna uh, dog here is I anticipate that over the course of the next several months as you all work through and the appropriators work through our budget, I would anticipate seeing some back and forth, maybe even some effort to limit our ability to, to invest in these uh, uh, new tools uh, in the course of this, uh, this budget cycle. So I just, I put that out there as something that we should, we should work, uh, make sure that we're working together on. Yeah. Thank you. And I see my time is running short, but I just wanted to say, if you remember a couple of years ago before the football game, we had our picture taken with Brittany, the young Marine. I do. I, how the, could I forget? Yeah, with the exoskeleton, and uh, it's been moving forward, and I guess there's more money into it, and I would guess I would implore you and every... The VA has lagged on, on getting uh, these devices that are proven to the veterans who need them. And with that, I, I yield back. I just say, I don't want to drag this out, uh, Chairman. Uh, I just want to say, I met yes, uh, last week with an amazing uh, soldier, triple amputee, uh, and from uh, his service in Afghanistan. I first met him at Walter Reed many years ago. I used to work in a different roles in the United States government. Um, his experience uh, in both managing his prosthetic prosthetics, but also the support that he's gotten for, for example, uh, adaptive technologies for driving, uh, left me with the impression that there's work for us to do across the board on this. So we're, we're instituting a, a journey map, a review of the veteran experience on this. We'll make sure that we include Brittany in that, uh, and we'll make sure that we're doing right by these uh, brave men and women. Representative Browning. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Spe Secretary, for being here. Thank you for highlighting vet centers um, and the trauma that too many of our women veterans experience in their service to our country. Vet centers are such an important footprint uh, within the VA infrastructure, so I really appreciate you mentioning both of those. I have a couple of questions, and if you could be as brief as possible, because I'd like to get them all in. Yes. So the, the first is on child care, and I noticed that the budget uh, requests $18.6 million for child care. Um, can you give uh, me some idea of the progress that you're making to ensure that every VA medical center has access to child care options as was promised in the Deborah Sampson bill? Yeah, well, thank you very much. We're obviously, uh, we're uh, taking this very seriously, obviously the pandemic, challenged us in that regard, but uh, we uh, see two paths to make this happen. One is direct to veteran reimbursement for the care that that veteran uh, invests uh, to facilitate his or her appointment. The second is uh, making sure that there is, uh, the second prong is making sure that there are uh, sites on campus. Uh, we think the two sites closest ready to go are Fresno and Shreveport. Uh, there's two questions here is, how quickly can we get the regulatory process done? Uh, the appropriators have warned us about that being slow. Uh, to an order, places on campus to open up. Uh, so we're looking now at whether there's sub-regulatory -reg guidance, meaning something more quick we can do to get those sites stood up, uh, to uh, partner along with uh, places like Seattle, where we have uh, deployed other pilots. Um, our our uh, promise in the Deborah Sa Sampson Act, I think, is by FY26, 
Uh, we'll uh, keep pushing on this very aggressively. I can't make a definitive uh, promise that we'll make FY26 at every VA facility, but there will be uh, good progress on this. Thank you. We should also try, uh, you know, try to put at least one to test it in a big urban, I think in a big urban center and a medical center. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, VA spending on our women veterans, it, is, it seems to me that it's difficult really f to determine whether the budget allocated for gender-specific care is proportional uh, to the growing rates of utilization um, of, our, of, of women in other uh, gender-specific care. Um, so it, it, do you have the data to compare these metrics over a five-year period, over a 10-year period? Uh, you know, what I can tell you is that we've uh, doubled in the last, we've doubled the funding in the last 10 years, but I can't, uh, I, let me take that and give you that uh, and uh, maybe lay that against the demographic or actuarial data to show you how we're making the investments because we do use the model, uh, as what we call the Milliman model, to inform our decisions on gender specific care uh, and to inform, inform our decisions on the Office of Women's Health, which, which oversees the, the, the WISE grants, which is also the basis by which we hire uh, gender-specific providers and deploy gender-specific technology like mammography. Um, so I, I think that's a fair question. Let us get that to you in writing. That'd be great, because it's, it's really hard with, without the data to really understand if we're, you know, the budgets that are being pro proposed are adequate enough based you know, we need that proportionality. I think that's a fair question. That's great, a, that's great, 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 great. So I also noticed that, um, you know, in, in the budget that you're seeking a 20% increase in the caregiver uh, support program and also um, I think for long-term support services, you're asking for $17.9 million, which I think is about an $800 million increase. So I, I guess my question is if... If um, we were to pass and put into law the Elizabeth Dole bill, would you eventually see the cost of those two programs diminish over time? It's a good question. Uh, for, in the interest of time, let me, let me just say two things. One, let me take that and get that back to you in writing because I hadn't considered that. Uh, but two, the, the investments that are in there um, are a reflection of uh, what we anticipate of turning back on the expanded caregiver program, uh, which we will do uh, over the course of this fiscal year. So, uh, sorry, next fiscal year into uh, 2025. So um, uh, let me make sure that I understand specifically the impact of, the, uh, of your bill on the long-term costs of that program, and I'll get that back to you. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Representative Rosenbaum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, good Secretary. Morning. Always good, good to see you again. And you. And you. Uh, like start off, thank you very much for your help in Montana. Uh, we are making a lot of progress to improving the health care delivery for the veterans there, and I'm looking forward to having a permanent director, which I understand is, is – uh, in the, Very soon, yes, yeah, yeah, in the uh, works. to make sure that we get Fort Harrison straight. Um, Secretary, in January, an opinion article on the Hill was written by three VA psychologists with over 40 years of clinical experience, and it was titled, The VA is Abandoning Women Veterans' Rights for Gender Identity. The article pointed out that single-sex spaces within the VA, those ensuring bodily privacy, such as bathrooms, exam rooms, and medical exam areas can now be accessed by males who self-identify as women. Now, we have just made an incredible investment in the VA facilities across the nation because of the growing population of females within the veterans community. And, and, and so I really don't understand so that we were making all this investment to try and make them feel comfortable, to make them feel more welcomed into the veterans' uh, facilities, why we would now 
be opening these, these exact same facilities to males who are identifying as women. Are you aware of a letter that I wrote about this topic with Representative Crane uh, back on February the 12th? I am aware of your letter. Uh, I'd, I'd have to refresh my, member, my memory if I've uh, responded to you yet, but uh, I know that we're working that. I also know that when I saw the report in the newspaper, I, uh, I also reached out to uh, VHA to make sure that they were talking to our uh, clinicians across the system and, and uh, you know, uh, our commitment to all of our vets is that they get care in a safe uh, environment, that they feel safe. Uh, and I have every uh, expectation, in fact, it is my conviction that we ensure that uh, for veterans. Uh, and, and, I, and, and we're not just talking now about the the veterans and their level of comfort to make sure that our female veterans can come into these facilities and feel in, inviting, okay, right. and, and feel safe about it. But the article was published. One of the psychologists' direct reports delivered a memorandum removing her from her role as a psychologist. The psychologist was pulled away from her patients for approximately one week after being reinstated. There's no question this resulted in disruption of care for her patients. And one of the other psychologists who wrote the article was kicked out of the VA chat and was previously prevented from supervising students for his opposition to DEI initiatives. You said at a press conference when asked about the article, we do not require our employees to choose between their conscience and their career. We don't. And so that is the case, 365, 24-7. That is a noble goal. However, these employees did speak their conscience and they were punished. There seems to be a little bit of a disconnect between the words and what has happened to these employees. Are you aware of the retribution that these employees had faced? What I, what I understand is that uh, it's standard VA practice that when uh, you know, uh, there is a dust up around a provider that uh, the local leadership would take a look at what the dust up is about and then they'd make some decisions about it. Uh, that's, uh, as I understand it, what happened in this case, as, you, as your question suggested, uh, the veteran, sorry, the provider went back to patient care within a week. You said there's no question that it impact the veteran's care. I, I actually haven't seen any sense that there is a question whether it impacted veteran's care, meaning I've seen no evidence that it did impact veteran's care. Uh, and those kinds of procedures which are laid out in VA VHA practice guidebooks across the system are, are the kinds of steps that I would think a, a responsive, uh, uh, high reliability organization would take. But, but the, the, the employees should not, in your words, be subject to retribution for speaking their. I don't conscience. think this was. I don't think this was retribution, uh, Congressman. Look again. I, 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 this is all derivative. I'm learning this partly to make sure that I can respond to you, and Mr. Crane. Um, but these are decisions. Uh, these are uh, potential uh, processes laid out in VHA guidebooks about uh, how to make sure that we're managing the provision of care effectively across the system. I don't think this is retribution. Uh, the person, uh, there is questions about uh, the the dust up. It sounds to me like the local leadership looked into it, and within a week. The person was back on the job. As to the employee-controlled uh, chat group, I, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna. I don't think it's appropriate for me uh, to start managing who's members and who's not members of a chat group. You know, okay. I think those are those are collegial decisions that our professionals can. Re, well, can I, I will take you at your word because yeah. we we always have been able to rely on each other, yes. and and it's always been my also my experience that when you are made aware of these things. Yeah that you have looked into them and, and made sure that they were, yeah. they were made straight. The last, the last comment that I would uh, just like to make is that while uh, Ranking Member Takano uh, embraces the expansion of the VA, what our job here is, is to make sure that the veterans get the care that they have earned, that they deserve, when they want it, where they want it, not to protect the VA. It is not 
to protect the VA. It is to make sure that the veterans get the care that they have earned and that they deserve when they want it, where they want it. And I assure you, when you're dealing in urban areas, it is a lot easier for the veterans to slip into a VA facility than it is in Montana, where we have 100,000 veterans that are dispersed across 145,000 square miles and they are heavily dependent on the community care in order to make sure that they're being taken care of. Thank you very much. I appreciate. Thank you. I appreciate all your work. Thank you, I, I, and I appreciate your your always being available to me. And you know, look, uh, I think Montana is a, is emblematic of the challenge that we face as a country, which is access in rural settings. I've spent time in many of your districts asking these same questions. I suggest that among uh, organizations making investments in rural settings, few rival the amount of dollars that VA itself is investing in rural settings, and I think that's important. And part of that is based on our belief that rural veterans deserve access to the highest quality care too, right? right. And so uh, this is also why we're working with DOD and even now with U.S. Department of Agriculture to make sure that we have high quality care sites available to veterans across the 140,000 miles. 145,000 square 000. miles. It's a little bigger in Minnesota, but not that much. <laughs> Thank you, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Levin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Secretary, great to see you. Thank you for uh, your continued you. uh, hard work on behalf of our veterans you. and your, your team as well. We appreciate you and thanks for visiting so many You're right to districts. thank them, they do all the work, not me. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for, for uh, always uh, being available, visiting so many of our districts. You're always welcome uh, you. in our district. I uh, wanted to get through a few questions. Uh, first, I, I wanted to bring something up that uh, I have uh, discussed in our budget hearings for the past two years, and that's the Veteran and Spouse Transitional Assistance Grant Program. I was proud to authorize the program as part of Isaacson Row uh, to support local organizations that provide coordinated transition assistance services such as resume assistance, interview training, and job recruitment training to veterans and their spouses. VA issued a proposed rule for implementation of this program in July 2023, and last month Congress appropriated $5 million to begin awarding grants. Now that VA has the funding in hand, when do you expect to open the grant application? Well, we're, we're working through the comments that we've received now, and so I, I gotta be careful about that, um, but we are working through those comments and then we'll publish uh, a final rule when we're done there and then we'll be in a position to, to begin administering the grants, um, you know, pursuant to it, well-established, publicly commented on uh, rules so that everybody gets a fair shot at them. Thank you for that. VA estimated that full program implementation would cost $26.3 million per year, but the FY25 budget request maintains level funding for $5 million. And with the program only authorized for five years, VA has limited time to scale it up, make the case for long-term authorization. So I have the same question for you that I did last year, hoping for a clear answer. When does VA plan to fully fund the program? When we can prove that, when we can prove that we have the right uh, programmatic setup to, to, to ensure that it's, it's successful. I think we wanna you know, uh, build to that uh, through experience and through uh, proven performance, rather than, which is something that we do all too often, buy the dream and then find out that we can't execute the full dream and we end up uh, complicating outcomes for veterans and, and uh, not being the best stewards of taxpayers' dollars along the way. So we'll build to it. I can't give you a, 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 a firm number on that, but uh, this is why it's so important that we get Along, along those lines, Mr. Secretary, will you commit to moving as expeditiously as you can? You so have I don't, that. You have I don't that. have to ask the same question next year. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, wanted to move on to a, uh, a local issue for me. The uh, Jennifer Moreno VA Medical Center in San Diego has been trying to purchase land from the University of California, San Diego, since fiscal year 2020. Uh, VA has not included this request in its short-term budget year requests. Uh, when VA facilities have to wait years for Congress and VA to allocate funding for a land acquisition project, the cost of the land continues to increase. We end up unnecessarily wasting uh, taxpayer money. In both last year and this year's budget request, you asked for Congress to pass legislation allowing VA to allocate funding for land acquisition projects without specific congressional authorization. 
The final fiscal year 24 appropriations bill included language that removed the requirement for VA to get specific authorization from Congress on VHA land acquisition projects, but it didn't un amend the underlying statute or allocate any funding for VHA land acquisition projects. So do you still need authorizing language in a separate appropriations line item to make the VHA land acquisition line item a reality? We do. So I look forward to working with my colleagues on this committee to get the authorization enacted in the law so we can get the resources to VA facilities as quickly as we can. Uh, lastly, Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for your steadfast commitment to ending veteran homelessness. Uh, your budget includes $3.21 billion for this purpose with increases for most programs ex except Supportive service Services for Veteran Families, SSVF, which would receive a decrease. SSVF, I believe, is the heart of VA's homelessness prevention efforts and has grown in recent years to fill critical needs. But can you discuss the rationale behind the funding decrease for SSVF? Yeah, you know, what, what uh, this year's uh, funding level really draws on what we learned last year, which is that um, we, we, we have an increase in unsheltered homelessness. So uh, this is why G, uh, grant per diem is really so important, but also why we're investing as much as we're investing in prevention this year. So we're trying to get ahead of the, the challenge by keeping more veterans in their homes, hence the things like the VAST program, um, but also trying to make sure that uh, we, because we saw last year for the first time uh, in a number of years, uh, I think three years, uh, an increase in 7% of uh, veteran homelessness, uh, which included unsheltered veteran homelessness. Um, so uh, that, that's what's reflected in the budget. I'm out of time, but again, I wanna say thank you for the hard work that you and your you. team are doing, and I look forward to further discussions soon. And thank I yield you. back. Representative Van Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, April 21st, 2023, Veterans Administration put something on their website, and I wanna ask you if this, these things became true. Uh, with our, our budget, we're discussing, uh, the Veterans Administration said that there'd be 30 million fewer veteran outpatient visits. Did that take place? No, we had a uh, net increase. In um, that we undermined uh, access to telehealth. Did that take place? Nope. Were wait times worsen for benefits because uh, you're going to be forced to eliminate 6,000 staff members? We get, and an we estimated get, 134,000 claims. We're resolving uh, claims 17 days faster this year than last. Um, were you prevented from construction of VA healthcare facilities that veterans needed? Nope. nope. Um, did you fail to honor the memories of all our veterans by eliminating approximately 500 staff that take care of our cemeteries? I did not. We did not. It did not happen. Okay, did you cut housing for veterans? I don't think you did because we just talked about that. Um, would, did increase, did food security increase for veterans? Yeah. Insecurity? No, it did not. It didn't, okay. Deprive veterans of mental health, substance use, healthcare services, did that happen? That didn't happen either, did it? Okay, did uh, you eliminate job training? I didn't do that either. So when the ranking member of this committee says that the VA will end as we know it if Donald Trump is elected, do you think that that's true? I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to get I don't like politicizing this either, sir, but I'm telling you, I'm not standing for this stuff. There, there are article after article after article about how Donald Trump increased the ability for veterans to get care. And this stuff that you put on your website and that these people echoed on the other side of this chamber, you just said on the record did not take place. So we're not going to fear monger here with our veterans. And I know you don't do it. You did it here. We talked about this. You came to our office but there's absolutely no place for this in this committee at all. And I believe that Mr. Takano should publicly apologize for this. Donald Trump will not be destroying the Veterans Administration as we know it when he is elected as president. Okay, I did not plan on doing that, but I'm not gonna stand by and listen to this political garbage in this committee at all. Okay, VASP, sir. Um, you said in your letter, you sent it over here last night about eight o'clock that um, you think that the VASP thing is gonna turn out well for veterans. Um, can you envision 
a world where the Veterans Administration is going to uh, force veterans to leave their homes? Will the Veterans Administration foreclose on a veteran and make them homeless? Uh, no. Okay. So here's the problem, sir. If the Veterans Administration assumes these loans, puts them on their books, first of all, the, the amount of work that's been done on this is wholly inadequate, even from the staffing amount of, of folks that you think you're going to have to hire to administer about $15 billion worth of loans. Um, and veterans may or may not be able to pay these loans back, and they're going to be on the VA books. And you just told me that you're not going to evict a veteran from a home which means that the Veterans Administration is going to be paying the mortgage of a home for a veteran, which means the government of the United States of America is going to essentially make these public buildings because we're paying for it, and you're going to have a private citizen living in a public building. And they tried that before in the Soviet Union, and it didn't work. So the issue that we have here, no one on this committee, Mr. Levin, who's my ranking member, who I respect tremendously, cares about veterans homelessness as do I. But this is not the way to do this. The Veterans Administration has the potential to destroy the second best thing the Veterans Administration has ever done. The first thing is the GI Bill. That fundamentally created the middle class. The second one is the Veterans um, Home Loan Guarantee. And by you guys doing this in a very unthoughtful manner, um, I'm afraid that you're gonna wreck that program. And we can't have that. Um, that's how I bought my home. Mm. And I want our young veterans to be able to buy homes with that program. And because there's been a, a nearly complete lack of thought put into this, and there has, we can go through it in a different forum. I don't want to extend this conversation. Um, I believe that you're going to do much more harm than good. And it's unintentional. Mm. So I'd like, again, to follow up. We had a meeting with the chairman uh, and your undersecretary on this. But we got to get down to brass tacks on this because I am unwilling to be the chairman of the subcommittee that is responsible for destroying the veteran home loan guarantee. So thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to see you. And you. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Representative Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, good morning. And good morning. I appreciate your thoughts uh, here today, particularly as they pertain to community care. Yes. And that's what I intended to ask about. Uh, I don't want to be repetitive here, but this is a, an issue that we think a lot about in New yes. Hampshire. Um, we know that we've got a lot of rural communities that are underserved. Community care uh, clearly has helped close important gaps, um, but uh, we also want to make sure that it doesn't supplant VA health care, uh, which is a concern that I hear directly from our medical center leadership. Uh, they've made great strides at improving services at the Manchester VA, recently opening uh, a wellness center. Uh, they've got a women's health clinic that's under construction. Um, but they are expressing concerns that they could be unable to further expand services at the facility and make it an attractive option for veterans if we're going to continue to see the community care budget increase. And this is in a state where everyone's automatically eligible for community care. So can you talk about that balance as it pertains to the Manchester VA and how we can work with leadership there to make sure they can continue to bolster services and uh, show veterans that uh, the advantage that they provide in terms of seeking care yeah. within that facility? Well, I th uh, thank you very much for the question. I appreciate the conversations we've had about this. Um, but uh, I think a challenge for, for uh, us as a country is to ensure that uh, there is greater access in rural communities to healthcare. And this is a, a major challenge in every one of your states, a particular challenge in yours. Um, and it's a particular challenge for VA because veterans are more likely than non-veterans to come from rural communities and to return to rural communities. So. Um, the, the, the challenge for us is making sure that we can get that care closer to veterans uh, be, and that we don't think that, hey, making a referral into the community is the end of our relationship with a veteran because, A, we have to uh, coordinate that care, make sure that it's fit into all the other care that the veteran is getting. Um, but we also have to make sure that we're not just referring the vet into the community and then he ends up driving three hours to see somebody in the private sector anyway, when uh, they might be able to go uh, a much shorter distance to come to a VA facility, even if that VA facility is outside the 30 or 60 minute drive time window. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're also trying to make it take advantage of uh, things like VA Health Connect. All of us 
have access, uh, well, I'll just say myself, I have access to Blue Cross Blue Shield. I can get a nurse practitioner on the phone uh, to triage concern about my kids or my, uh, my family or myself. Uh, we now through VA Health Connect have uh, uh, concluded 45 million calls last year. These wouldn't be included in the clinical encounters we, I talked about earlier. That uh, gets a, a vet in touch with a nurse practitioner to resolve that veteran's question. Uh, obviating the need to travel. Uh, that is the kind of use of telehealth, the kind of use of uh, triage available options that we're trying to test to ensure that we don't boil this down to just say, hey, you qualified for uh, travel time. Here's your referral over you. Go, go take care of this. Sure. And I'm wondering if you can uh, address uh, concerns that some of the VSOs have in their testimony about uh, the infrastructure uh, spend in fiscal year 25. The request is 33% lower uh, than last year. Um, some concerns also around state home construction grant programs. Uh, funding, um, VA uh, re um, requested uh, $30 million less than FY24 levels, which we know is woefully short of yeah. where we need to be to fund priority projects, uh, and especially as we think about the number of veterans uh, that are in long-term care in these facilities. Uh, can you talk about specifically the state home construction grant program and um, right. that that level that you requested? Yeah, look, as I said that uh, at the in my opening, in the opening set of questions, the the CAPS did force uh, difficult decisions on uh, the federal government. I think that is as, as, as it, well, it is as it is. And uh, this is one of those uh, cases where we made that decision. Um, we, we, are, we are examining different um, funding streams. As I said, other cooperation with other federal agencies. Last year we attempted uh, to try to get mandatory funding for this, to make sure that we can invest at the levels and rates we need to. Um, when your average facility in terms of hospitals, I don't have to remind you of this, is 62 years old, um, the major construction account is not going to be made whole each year at you know $2 billion. So we have to figure out a different way to do that. Uh, we're testing options, and I really appreciate the VSOs pushing on this uh, because we have to figure out how we get around uh, a difficult set of caps, uh, especially when we have the dynamic on costs that we've been talking about throughout the course of the hearing. Yeah, thank you for your comments there. It's a huge issue. We've got a significant backlog. We've got to address it. Thank and, you. Uh, yield back. Representative Matra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir. Good to see you as always, sir. Thank you. Thank you for all the hard work. And please pass the word to all the undersecretaries and everybody that comes in front of the Disability Assistance Subcommittee. And Thank I'm you. not always easy on it, but they're doing, they're yeah, doing an amazing I job. Yeah. I heard you um, state that the previous year's numbers and the growth rate employees and, and the successes that we have are having in the VA, which I'm, I'm happy, over the moon about. But there is one number that grew last year that you and I spoke about that shouldn't be growing. And that's your number one issue from what I understand of the VA issue, and that's suicide. Yes. That is something we have yet to corral. And as a neuroscientist studying the brain and emotional behaviors for the past 15 years now, I think, I, 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 I want to solve this problem. We sh this shouldn't be a conversation that we're having. And you and I, every time we have a meeting together, this is the number one topic that we talked about. And I heard the general speak about um, the progression of alternative medications in space of our alt an alternative to the opioid problems that we have, the SSRIs, and, yes. and the existing modalities that we are utilizing for these problem sets that, you know, if you roll the clock back a decade, the numbers are, they're sustained. Right. We are not doing what we need to be doing. Right. And we need to fix that problem, and, and, and it, 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 it saddens and sickens me to sit here in the House of Representatives, representatives to say that, hey, we have this problem, we have to fix it, but we say this every year. Every year. And I want the VA to be the leading edge of the sword. You have that capability. If there's legislation that's not in place that allows the VA to be where the, all, the, all the other institutes of higher learning and research come running to the VA to say, you are leading the way, how can we help you or can we learn from you? That's what I want to see. Because that transcends the research space down into our veteran community where we don't have this problem set. What, with the, with the budget line, I mean, I throw numbers at this all day long. 
what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this problem? And I know you can't answer that question because it exists in such a wide net that we have to cast, but no more. I mean, we six was well, over 6,000 deaths last year. What, what are we doing? How are we going to fix this problem, sir? I mean, with this budget line, are we moving money in the proper direction to centrally focus on this issue? Yeah. Well, I, I think that we got to, as you're suggesting, I think we got to get the solutions closer to the veterans' communities and closer to the veteran. And so uh, I think what you see in this, uh, in this budget is enhanced efforts at outreach to try to get veterans into our care, uh, enhanced uh, investments in the people and organizations who know their vets best. So, you know, uh, the and it, if it's community care or di primary direct primary care out of the VA, that's that. But also investing in local organizations who know that. Yes, absolutely. So, so uh, but we have to be. And I hate to say this, sir, because I'm not. I would never yeah. put myself in your position. But we have to be hyper aggressive on this. And I yes. mean, in an uncomfortable momentum. Yeah. No. Look, I mean, we got to be like uh, hyper aggressive about it because. We have to act like a life depends on it because it turns out more than 6,000 do depend on it. And so th this is the whole idea is to get the care, the awareness, the investments closer to the veteran, closer to the people who know the veterans most to ensure that when uh, a veteran stops showing up, when a veteran is isolated, there's support. A, people know that. There's support for people who know that to do something about it. Uh, and then there's availability of, of uh, mental health treatment so that when the veteran uh, reaches a moment when he will come out of isolation and get the care, that he doesn't have to wait to get the care, that he gets the care. And, you know, we're trying to push that as close to the veteran as we can. I would, I would like to see the expansiveness of this of not only this dollar amount, but the, the research mechanism inside the VA yes. go out into deeper waters, deep yes. brain stimulations. That's, yes. We're seeing research that says, hey, that, that addresses addiction and emotional instability. Yes. You know, and, I, and I'm going to close with my last 20 seconds. I, I don't know if I heard you correctly, but did you say there's going to be problems on this side as far as moving appropriations to research with the psychedelic medications? I, 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 I'm just re I'm reading back to you the memcons that I got out of our briefing about our budget. Uh, I think we were surprised that we got a little pushback. I can't, I can't remember from whom we got the I pushback. I can assure you I'll be digging into that because not only just the veterans in this committee that you see now, but there's, there's a, a high majority of congressional members that they don't want this problem to exist any longer. And I think with the research and the experiences that the veterans have had to share with the body, I think we can put that you, you know, like you've been, you, you've made the sale, you've underscored to me the, the impact of this, and the more I scratch at it, the more, as I told you, I'm skeptical. Yes, sir, but I, the more I understand. I, the more I scratch at it, the more, and the more I hear from our providers, uh, the more uh, uh, determined we are to make sure that we make do the right thing here. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Representative Sheriff Alyssa McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Secretary, the fiscal year 25 request indicates a 44% cut to the IT modernization account. The budget seems to be focused on maintaining legacy systems over modernizing them. There are several modernization efforts already in progress. How do you intend to fund those programs under this budget? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, among the challenges in the budget, uh, this is one. Uh, and so, uh, as I said, the, the CAPS uh, and the fact that we're no longer operating in, in the pandemic era of uh, very, very generous appropriations, which again, I, I thank everyone on the committee, Republicans and Democrats for those investments. Um, the, this is a maintenance budget. I'll just be very candid with you. And uh, as we've briefed it out, uh, we have made that clear uh, to, um, uh, to your teams as well. Uh, and that's true in, in IT. And so we got to make sure that we are um, the uh, that that we are maintaining uh, the progress we've made. We do have incremental funding so that we can maintain 
uh, momentum on modernization projects like FMBT, for example. Uh, and um, obviously, uh, we'll stay on top of those, but uh, you know, the budget does force some tough, some tough choices, and IT is one of those places. So you said it's a maintenance budget, but right now when we look at the EHRM budget, which was cut in half, I understand that it's related to the program's current status under reset. However, the dramatic budget cut in this program leaves me concerned that there are no real plans to move from reset to implementation. Yeah. Do you expect EHRM to resume any go lives in fiscal year 25? Yeah, well, here's, what, here's what I'd say. We're not staying in reset forever. We're gonna get into deployment. One, two, why? Because this is really, really, really important and we are committed to making it happen. We need a single health record across the VA system and we need one that talks uh, more effectively to DOD. Um, the fact is that when we get to, the, well, our, during the course of this year, as we approach the end of the year, I anticipate us uh, being in discussions to get out of reset. Um, and when we get there, remember that we have, this is one of the things that the chairman talked about, we have carryover, we have prior year funding, it's three year funding available to us to deploy in the first instance uh, beyond the reset. So uh, we have existing money that would not be accounted for, uh, prior year appropriated money not accounted for uh, in this year's request that is slated uh, and available for us when we uh, exit reset. So just for clarification purposes, do you yes. plan on being in reset for the entirety of fiscal year 25 or not? We do not. And how do you plan on specifically funding the go lives if we're having this? With the, with the three-year fund, three funding that's existing already, we have that at VA already. So we have prior, year, prior authorized, uh, prior appropriated money available to us to deploy when we get out of reset. Okay, the budget request also indicates a 65% cut in the infrastructure readiness program that is focused on addressing VA's massive technical debt. Given that most of VA's work relies on the department's aging IT infrastructure, this is a huge disservice to VA employees and veterans. How can VA expect to expand access to care and benefits for veterans on IT systems and equipment that are growing older and more obsolete every day? Well, uh, this is why, for example, uh, TEF is so important. TEF uh, allows us, and look, we've been very, very careful with the TEF. Uh, the law that you all passed said any incremental funding for the treatment of uh, toxic exposure over the FY21 baseline can be TEF. We've been very careful about this. We've briefed your teams at length about it. Uh, we have methodologies for each of our components, including IT, OINT, and we're gonna be in a position to make sure that, um, that uh, th because of that TEF money, we can continue to make progress, including on important uh, infrastructure improvements like uh, benefit delivery. Moreover, uh, some of our infrastructure was bought ahead uh, during, for example, EHRM deployment, we're getting sites uh, deployment ready. So we're in a position to uh, continue, as I said, maintain momentum, continue momentum, maybe not at the level we would have anticipated in a, in a place where, I forget who, who said that, some, I guess General Bergman said that sometimes money seems infinite. We get that it's not. Mm -hmm. We think it's prudent to make the decisions that we're making. And we think that we have a, a plan to, to make that happen. Well, one more thing I wanted to ask you, because it seems like with all the cuts, you're really relying on the excess or the supplemental funds that you had from TEF and other sources. Now, do you have any concerns that you might run short? Because it seems like in all these cut areas that you're planning on supplementing it there. And so is there enough to supplement the entire budget because we see so, so much extensive cuts? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think I would just disagree with the characterization of extension, extensive cuts. I think we've been trying, you know, as I said, you were very generous to us throughout the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we have been planning, uh, carefully, carefully planning the use of those funds. So those carry, carryovers, are, those are incorporated into the budget uh, laid out in front of you. Uh, and we're in a position to use those. Do, am I worried that you know we're going to have to you know for example the chairman mentioned that there's no second bite in the budget 
Um, we don't anticipate one, but if we, if we need one, we'll come back and talk to you guys about it. And, Thank you, uh, I yield back. Thank you, it's the chair's intent to recognize Representative Self for his five minutes, and then we will go uh, break and go into recess for the uh, ambassador's speech and return, please, as quickly as possible. So, after the speech. Uh, thank Self, you, Mr. Like Chairman that. and uh, Mr. Secretary. Good to see you. Sir. Uh, I've, I've heard several comments uh, in this uh, hearing that uh, community care is more expensive. According to your budget, and this was, this was uh, quickly done, you're asking for 52 million outpatient visits at community care for $37 billion. You're also expecting 89 million outpatient visits with VHA for $83 billion. Now, this indicates that uh, community care is not more expensive, so we probably ought to refine our figures and our, and our comments along those lines. Uh, do, you have a, do you have a sense of the ratio of your 10,000 cuts, personnel cuts through attrition? What will be the ratio of bureaucracy versus frontline providers? Do you have a sense? Uh, I think I could probably get you a more detailed sense of that. I think we just did a deep dive with your staffs last week, but we have obviously prioritized uh, hiring frontline providers, uh, frontline workers. Uh, I think uh, throughout the course of the pandemic, we did, uh, for example, because we were, we did make a decision to protect most vulnerable veterans in our care. We did make a decision uh, in individual facilities to move more care into uh, the community. So that requires a different kind of hire in those uh, pandemic years, 2020, 2021, for example, uh, than uh, we would normally be making. So uh, I would anticipate that uh, in this year of strategic hiring, we're focusing overwhelmingly in the hires on providers. I, I would ask you that through your attrition, uh, what is the ratio of your loss, however you want to structure that, because I want to, I, I want to we'll focus you, exactly you as you just said. We yep. need to be focused on our providers. Yep. If we take the attrition cuts, it needs to be in the bureaucracy. Yep. Now, in the latest uh, budget that was passed, uh, the one we're in now, yes, uh, I, I understand that now you are. It is very clear that you are not to uh, report uh, veterans who have a fiduciary to the NICS database. Is that correct, and have you changed your policies to make sure that does not happen, that we are giving the constitutional protections to our veterans uh, simply because they have a fiduciary? Um, uh, let, me, let me answer that question by what we did, because I'm not sure I understand about changing the policies. Um, uh, in, in the past, you have, uh, because you read the law differently than most people, other federal agencies, that if you have a fiduciary for a veteran, you would then put them in the NICS database. That was your policy in the past. And I think that is forbidden under the latest budget, and I want to make sure that your policies follow the law. Yeah. So we, we uh, turned off our, I think it's a monthly uh, or bi-monthly reporting mechanism to the Department of Justice. Uh, we turned that off when Congress enacted the, uh, the rider on the appropriations bill. So we are not reporting uh, any fiduciaries, any new fiduciaries to the Department of Justice at the moment. Uh, nor, incidentally, uh, since that reporting is now turned off, can we take any veterans no longer on the fiduciaries who had been reported to justice off. And so uh, the reporting is turned off. And does that apply to your uh, advanced budget for 2025, I guess, as it well? Is, it is an appropriations bill rider. Mm -hmm. So it, as with all appropriations bill riders, it will expire at the end of the fiscal year. That was my question. I'm afraid that is the case. Um, I also, uh, and, and I'm almost out of time, I, I would like for you to look at the uh, training videos uh, that you're using in VA today. 
Uh, they are produced by someone that is associated with uh, Planned Parenthood, and I am very concerned that uh, they promote abortion as the safest option for pregnant veterans. I find that uh, a little uh, oxymoron uh, in, in aspect, but I would well, ask I would, you I would to, think that, that I would have a hard time believing that's true. Well, absolutely. But I'll, I'll find out. And I would ask for a report on that because uh, that, if this is true, and apparently it is, I, I would like to know about it. Fair enough. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the committee will stand in recess until the end of the uh, ambassador's speech. Uh, hopefully, like I said, everybody can get back. And, and Mr. Secretary, thank you for staying. Yeah, uh, of course, of course. Thank you very much.
committee will come back to order. Uh, at this time, we're going to continue with questions. Uh, Representative DeLuio, uh, if you would have five minutes to ask your question. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Secretary, good to see you. Thanks for our patience uh, as we welcome the Japanese Prime Minister today. Uh, I'll be blunt, I'm a little worried about this budget. Uh, I think it's driving a trend toward privatization that I'm alarmed by. Since the VA Mission Act was implemented, we've seen fee-for-service, fee excuse me, uh, community care go from accounting for a relatively limited portion of VHA's budget intended to help prove, improve veterans' access to care when direct care from the VA wasn't convenient, wasn't nearby, it didn't make sense, to now what I think is a ballooning program that now accounts for more than a third of all spending on veterans' health care with worse outcomes in many respects. So that community care has been siphoning funds from what I think is already an underfunded Veterans Health Administration. The trends show that that sign, for those signs aren't gonna be changing anytime soon. Uh, since 2020, the financial obligations for medical community care, it's grown about twice the rate of VA direct care, and yet we already know that community care is more expensive. Uh, its quality on many measures has been worse. Patient outcomes in many places have been worse. Care coordination is worse. Oversight is more limited. So let's talk as an example of that emergency room care. A study found veterans treated in private ERs twice as likely to die in the first 28 days after admission than if they had been admitted to a VA facility. If veterans had an ambulance transport them to the VA emergency department, their prospect of dying in the subsequent months was 46% lower than if they had gone to a non-VA facility. Let's talk about opioids. Last September, the OIG released a report about the stunning lack of oversight of private non-VA providers who prescribe opioids to veterans outside the VA. Found that about 80% of those non-VA providers who prescribed opioids to veterans uh, in FY21 did not complete VA's training module, nor certify they received and reviewed the guidelines put in place under the Mission Act. And their sample of those community providers uh, show that around two-thirds didn't check the state databases that are meant to monitor against overprescriptions and abuse. Let's talk wait times. We don't have, frankly, wait time data. Veterans can't look up what a wait time will be in community care. Uh, but based on most of the studies, wait times are shorter in VA care and getting better. So the same is not happening in the community. Training. Uh, VHA doesn't require the same training it does of VA providers for folks in the community, and only a small share of those private providers complete the training. So I think we're at a tipping point. I think this privatization trend is not fiscally responsible. I don't think it's good for veterans. Uh, just this week, I received notice that the Pittsburgh VA in my district, effective immediately, is implementing a hiring freeze. And why? The explanation given, so they can deal with rising costs of fee-for-service community care. So I see the direct connection, it worries me. I know Pittsburgh VA is probably not alone in this. I, I think, Mr. Secretary, this budget is doing much of the same to encourage these trends that I worry about. More than 20 billion has already been appropriated to fee-for-service community care for 2025. Community care has already received 9.8 billion from the cost of war toxic exposure fund, as I understand it. And this budget proposes siphoning around 7.3 billion from VA direct care to fee-for-service community care. Do I, do I have the basic numbers right, Mr. You Secretary? do, okay. yeah, you do. I, I know you agree we need to curb the spending issue here. Uh, one way I think VA could easily do that would be to update access standards so that telehealth counts. In other words, VA today uh, can't point to the availability of a telehealth appointment when thinking about whether someone would be referred to the community, and yet that same veteran might find themselves receiving a telehealth appointment. So my question, Mr. Secretary, do you plan to change those access standards, and if so, what is that timeline looking like? I know we've talked before yeah. about this. Yeah, thank, uh, Mr. Deluzio, thank you very much. Uh, we are looking at the access standards. We're looking expressly at the telehealth access standard. We've talked to your teams about this, mm -hmm. uh, House and Senate. Um, we do think that it's not uh, helpful to veterans to give them a referral, um, and then they just end up seeing a doctor uh, in telehealth outside the VA system. Uh, so we think that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we are looking at that. I can't give you a specific timeline on that regulation, but we are working it. Uh, and then we have two other parts of our, uh, in a, a two other additions to our strategy over and above what I talked about before, which is the apple to apple offer of an out, uh, in-house in care 
every time a veteran's referred out. Uh, we have dramatically increased access through our access sprints. We saw 25,000 new patients, more new patients in uh, VA clinics October to February. That's an 11% increase. We saw that increase in 81% of our facilities, including Pittsburgh. Uh, that means 14% fewer veterans had to wait to get into the community. They got directly into VA. We did that through offering evening clinics, weekend clinics, additional access to telehealth. So we're going to continue to do that. All of that requires us to maintain strategic hiring. That's why we had the good hiring year we had mm -hmm. last year, and that's why the strategic hiring will continue. Lastly, in your visit, I think Pittsburgh and the rest of that system does a very good job at using telehealth authorities across the state to get access to things like tele-oncology. And let me just say one thing about tele-emergency care. We've now rolled this out in 25,000 in individual instances across VA. Uh, th so far this year, 15,000, 10,000 ca cases last year. The median case has us meet the veteran's medical needs within 30 minutes, never leaving his home, meaning he doesn't have to drive, he doesn't have to risk infection, he doesn't have to risk hassles of going to an emergency department, a VA emergency department, or a private sector emergency department. Things like that, veteran, VA Health Connect, tele-emergency care, uh, and enhanced access, as we've just demonstrated in the last five months of the access sprints, means that we will make sure that a veteran has timely access to the best available care, namely the VA system, uh, whenever and with clear understanding of what those parameters for each offering will be. Mr. Secretary, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for indulging on the time. I, I, I appreciate the apples to apples work. I think it's very important, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Dr. Milner Uh Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's uh, wonderful yeah. to see you again, Secretary McDonough. Thank you, Bost, uh, uh, Chairman Bost, uh, for holding this hearing. And uh, let me just say that uh, I'm a veteran, I'm a doctor, I delivered community care, and I had excellent outcomes. Uh, thank you very much. Despite having tremendous uh, hurdles getting the VA to prove to approve of community care. Um, so Secretary McDonough, um, have no difficulties with uh, tele-emergency care. We actually had that discussion yesterday in energy and commerce or access standards. Um, I want to know, number one, of care that's delivered in the community, how much of it is specialty care and how much of it is primary care? It's uh, uh, overwhelmingly specialty care. Uh, thank you. Uh, so that would make a difference in the cost uh, regardless of whether that care was provided at the VA, specialty care is higher than it is generalized primary care, is it not? Yeah, yeah. well, it cost is a function both of the care provided, but then also what we call the standard episodes of care provided. Yeah. And, uh, and what we find is that uh, the access standards as, or the standards as prescribed now for many years include a suite of standard episodes of care that lead to uh, what appears to be redundant care, what appears to be maybe prescribing techniques, uh, like uh, Mr. Deluzio said. And this is not u uniformly the case. I'm just saying these are some of the things that we see that uh, contribute in, in, the I, in the IG's findings anyway, contribute to uh, and, the And do you have severity data um, on patients that are either admitted to the hospital or come to the ER, i.e., are you, to your point, are we comparing apples to apples? Uh, severity data in what sense? I'm sorry. In individuals who go to the emergency room uh, or are admitted to the hospital, what severity, medical severity are they? And if you don't have that data, if you could get that data to us. That, sure, that I don't have it at my fingertips, okay. but yeah. Thank you. Um, I understand the VA is setting up a red team to write a report on reducing community care spending, but the report has not been shared with this committee. Who are the members of this red team? Who appointed them? And what are they recommending? Good, uh, thanks for the question. Um, the, the red team is, uh, as is kind of standard, uh, analytic tool uh, designed to answer questions about what has happened uh, with community care over the course of the last six years since the new law was signed uh, into statute. Um, they, I gather they've finished their report. I've not seen it. They've submitted it to VHA. 
Um, the, the members of the committee include uh, former uh, undersecretaries of health in Republican and in Democratic uh, administrations, as well as uh, public health uh, and medical experts. I don't have the names in front of me because, frankly, I'm not uh, intimately familiar with the report yet, although I will get there. And is um, any veteran forced to go into community care? Is what? Is any veteran forced to go into community care? You know, it's, it's an interesting question. You, you talk to veterans and f some of them feel that they have been. And so... And, but why would uh, that be? Uh, specifically, the Mission Act is within 30 days or so many miles. So if a, v, if a veteran can get into an appointment within 30 days at the within VA... 20, within they, 20 days for, special, uh, for uh, primary care. Then they have no need to seek community care, care um, right. is, is my point. So a veteran's not forced right. to go into community care. I, however, know veterans who would prefer to go into community Definitely. care. And building new clinics to get access when you have hospitals or other facilities that are in deplorable condition, I would say would, uh, would question one's priorities. Um, HUD, uh, a question on homelessness that was uh, asked, um, HUD uh, VASH is an important program to permanently house veterans' homelessness, and I applaud the VA's work to house over 48,000 vets last year. Um, however, uh, I, I think there are still some challenges that we have. So do you know how many vouchers are made available on an annual basis? I don't have the voucher number at my, on my okay. fingertips. And do you know how many vouchers are unused on an annual basis? We, we have that. We can get you that data by, uh, by vision, but we have that data. And we set execution standards every year, and we report those to you guys. Okay. So my understanding is that many of the HUD VASH vouchers go unused year after year. So why are we still increasing the overall budget for this program? Uh, th that is true that some uh, uh, HUD VASH Vouchers go unused. Uh, we've identified a range of reasons why that is. Sometimes that the value of the voucher is insufficient given the uh, price in the particular market. Some of it has to do with our uh, slowness in appointing or hiring case managers, which are really important. Uh, well, to work maybe with instead landlords. of letting 10,000 healthcare providers go and increasing the number of bureaucrats, as was alluded to earlier, maybe that's a part of our budget we could rethink. With that, I yield back. So just, uh, just for the record, uh, the, the, our proposal is not to uh, reduce pro uh, clinical providers and increase bureaucrats. Um, and the, I just want to go back to one thing about how veterans feel. You know, the veteran signal is something that uh, we've instituted now for 10 years. Uh, it's a really important tool. Um, and, you know, what we do find is that, uh, I hear it anecdotally, we see it in some, in some of the data, that veterans feel that they have been uh, forced into the community. I'm not saying that they have. I'm saying that they feel that. This is why it's so important to us to communicate to every veteran very clearly, apple to apple, what their opportunities are. And we feel that when they're in our care, they do better. That's what study after study says. Uh, Wait, Miller, Dr. Miller makes you want to reclaim time. Uh, I'm going to reclaim my time. Uh, thank you for that. Um, when I'm out with veterans, and uh, I'm in the veteran community a lot as a fellow veteran, mm -hmm. um, they love the care they receive at the VA hospital. They don't like waiting periods, but they also appreciate the care they receive in the community, and they want choice, and they want flexibility. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. Representative Bozinski. Thank you, Chairman Bost um, and Ranking Member Deluzio. And Secretary, it's great to see you. Nice to thank see you. you for all the work you and your team do at thank the VA you. every day for our veterans. It's thank very you. appreciated. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about research that the VA is doing. I very much believe that that work that the VA is doing in the research fields is critically important to understanding um, illnesses and mental health. Um, its research breakthroughs have huge impacts on not only our veteran populations, but on the general population as well. Um, I'm glad to see that VA's research priorities largely reflect the needs of the veteran population. But I am concerned that the actual funding request does not meet the urgency of the research, for research on these topics. Additionally, the latest VA Veterans Suicide Prevention Report noted an increase in veteran suicide, and specifically that that rate um, has increased dramatically for women veterans in particular. I'm wondering how the VA is ensuring the budget request is taking into account the specific needs of our women veterans. Um, and so my question, Secretary McDonough, in that vein is, can you speak to why the fiscal year 2025 budget request 
includes flat funding for suicide prevention efforts and decreases funding for our VA priority areas like the Million Veterans Program, Precision Oncology, or um, ORD infrastructure, and TBI and brain health research in particular. Yeah, yeah well, thanks very much. You know, um, as, I, as I said earlier, that obviously we make tough choices in the budget, and, and uh, that, that is a function of the caps, and, and uh, that is a, also a function of being now in this period post-pandemic where we just don't have the very, very, very generous budgets that we had uh, gotten from you, uh, you all over the previous several years. Um, nevertheless, uh, the research budget does allow us to uh, continue uh, funding for priority research efforts. Uh, the Million Veteran pro pro Program uh, is obviously a very big priority for ours, for us. Uh, it's a, also a very significant security priority for us, by the way. Um, and uh, ability to access that uh, database is not solely dependent on VA funding. And so the important uh, innovations that will come out of that database are not uh, uh, uniquely connected to our funding. Um, we have uh, researchers who can bid to use that data, uh, and that means that prior year robust investments in tools like that mm -hmm. mean that uh, very innovative research can continue uh, into the uh, out years, notwithstanding, for example, when we uh, reduce investments in that. Um, as it relates to women's health and women's health research in particular, uh, we uh, are all of our research decisions are made by uh, the veteran experience and by what veterans therefore are experiencing. And our budget uh, does allow both based on existing funding, uh, it does allow us to continue advancements in particular uh, focuses for women veterans. And so um, it, it's true that if we could do more, we would obviously welcome that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But we think that these are important investments. Is the VA able to, you know, assuming that these funding levels stay where they, where you've requested, is there kind of preparation that the VA can be doing to take into account just to make sure that these programs continue to optimally Definitely. operate and, and coordinate with VSOs in particular for their feedback on how um, to kind of work with the VA on these, these types of funding levels? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Great. Um, I wanted to ask about another um, question as well, um, another important note. Chairman Boston and I share some VA facilities. Um, and I want to ensure that our rural veterans are getting the care that they need, something that I've taken a specific interest in um, on this committee. One of those facilities I wanted to ask you about is the VA hospital in St. Louis. Um, what are some of the ways the VA is explore, exploring optimizing rural health care initiatives and infrastructure projects given the budget constraints? Uh, for VA facilities like the St. Louis VA, which serve large numbers of rural and women veterans. Yeah, well, thanks so much. Uh, you know, for the last couple of years that I've been here, the Office of Rural Health um, has been flat funded, but it's been flat funded for a really important reason, which is, first and foremost, it's a, the print, one of the principal funders for the clinical resource hubs and for uh, the rural health centers of excellence or the rural, uh, rural Health Resource Centers. There's five of those. <clears throat> and that funding allows us to then uh, make sure that we can uh, um, uh, expand the capability of uh, VAMCs like St. Louis mm -hmm. to reach farther into rural communities through telehealth and through innovations. The second thing that the Office of Rural Health allows us to do is invest in new modalities of the, uh, of the provision of care in rural settings. Home-based primary care is a, is a good example of this. Uh, tele, um, tele health care uh, over the course of the last 10 years or so was uh, underwritten by the Office of Rural Health. Uh, those things get uh, incubated by the Office of Rural Health, but then get deployed into the field and therefore funded by the medical care account itself. Uh, lastly, uh, as it relates to um, rural facilities, we are more and more deploying through programs like uh, Closer to Me, which is a 
uh, oncology treatment and infusion care uh, uh, program allows us to deploy providers from somewhere like St. Louis mm -hmm. into a CBOC in a more rural setting in Southern Illinois or Central Illinois uh, and have a veteran get their oncology treatment at the CBOC rather than driving all the way to St. Louis. It reduces the, the demand, uh, the, the, the challenge of travel for that veteran, um, allows the veteran maybe then to have family with them as they're getting that infusion. Um, and it uh, means that the veteran doesn't have, also have to go into the, the private sector, which may not have uh, treatment op options any closer uh, than that CBOC. So um, these kinds of efforts to promote uh, access and to promote ease of access are a big part of our strategy going forward. That's great. Thank you, Secretary. I yield back. Thanks. Thank So, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your time you. um, and, and waiting around with this situation that we had today. But no I do problem. need to, to, to address one more important matter before you leave. Please. Um, over the past year, VA has been more than a month late in responding to over a dozen letters. Currently, VA owes this committee responses to numerous letters, including on important issues like improper benefit payments, abortion, and employee misconduct at VA medical centers. Further, when VA finally respond to committee letters, the response is often inadequate. Uh, you repeat, uh, your repeated failure to provide sufficient answers to my ORMDI letter last fall led to the committee's first subpoena in eight years. Most recently, in your two month, you're two months late on a response to a letter seeking documents related to VA's attorney, anti-Semitic anti uh, comments uh, and we haven't been given any of the documents that we were asking for. So I do wanna ask if we can get your commitment for the, those documents that I asked for and the letter that was in January 20, that we'd sent on January 25th, uh, if we could try to get those by next Friday, if at all possible. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, turn to this as soon as I get back to the office. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for, as I said, waiting around when we don't, you know, we don't normally do this. So. No, no, thanks very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank, Thank you. you. And we'll put, we'd like to welcome the next panel up. All right, I'd like to welcome our second panel. Thank you for hanging around for the length of time you did, and we appreciate it. And so representing the independent budget service organizations from the Veterans of Foreign War, War we have Mr. Patrick Murray, uh, the Director of National Legislative Services. We also have Mr. Shane Learman, uh, the Deputy National Legislative Director of Disabled American Veterans. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Butler, the Senior Health Policy uh, Advisor at Paralyzed Veterans of America. And I ask the witnesses to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, and let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Mr. Murray, I now recognize you for five minutes for an opening remark. Thank you, Chairman Bost. Uh, Ranking Member Deluzio and members of the committee, on behalf of the independent budget VSOs, DAV, PVA, and VFW, thank you for the opportunity to present our recommendations to properly fund 
the Department of Veterans Affairs. For more than 30 years, the IBVSOs have provided independent recommendations to ensure that VA remains fully funded and capable of carrying out all of its missions. I would ask for the record, our complete independent budget document will, be, will provide an overview of our most significant recommendations. First, it's important to note that VA's full year appropriations was not enacted until half the year had passed. This routine use of continuing resolutions limits VA's ability to expand access to critical benefits and services for veterans. We believe Congress must do better. Mr. Chairman, with veterans continuing to roll and receive higher priority eligibility due to PACT Act, the IBVSOs recommend that VHA be provided a total of $152.8 billion for FY25, which would be a 6.6% .6 increase from the previous year. Underlying all of VA's healthcare delivery is its infrastructure, the buildings in which it provides care and services. We are concerned that VA's request for major and minor construction is one third lower than what VA requested last year. And that is far below what is necessary. We recognize the critical importance of having modern up-to-date facilities, which is why the IBVSOs recommend 5.2 billion alone for major construction, which is four times more than the current funding level and almost $1 billion for minor construction, which would be a 30% increase. Infrastructure funding has remained stagnant for far too long. In the past 10 years, it has only increased 5%. During that same time, the construction backlog known as the Strategic Capital Infrastructure, uh, sorry, Strategic Capital Investment Plan, known as the SKIP, has grown exponentially. In 2014, the SKIP was approximately $60 billion worth of work. Right now, it's estimated to be $130 billion. That's an increase of 116%. Funding cannot remain stagnant. Private healthcare invests considerably more into the infrastructure of their networks. Last Congress, Kaiser Permanente testified before the Senate Veterans Committee that they invest approximately 3% of their overall budget into its infrastructure. VA invests considerably less, only close to 1%. Unless there's drastic increase in resources for VA infrastructure, we will continue to see additional gaps in the backlog versus work that is able to be performed each year. Infrastructure costs have gone up year over year. And they will not get any less expensive over time. This will also force more care into the community and exacerbate hiring challenges for VA. Mr. Chairman, generally the administration's budget request takes a positive step towards fulfilling our nation's obligations to America's veterans in fact, with the exception of a few items like the aforementioned infrastructure issue, VA budget meets or comes close to many of our recommendations. However, we do have concerns about funding trends in the VA's budget. Over the past decade, VA's reliance on community care has risen drastically. While we agree that veterans must have non-VA options to fill gaps in care, we believe VA must remain the primary provider and coordinator of veterans care. While VA is requesting an overall increase for medical care, the community care program would grow at a faster rate than VA provided care. In addition, VA's request would cut 10,000 healthcare FTE, including 600 physicians, 2,400 nurses, 500 non-physician providers, and over 2,000 healthcare technicians, despite VA reporting more than 66,000 healthcare vacancies at the start of this year. We should not be cutting positions when we can't even fill the ones we currently have. We're also concerned that VA proposes using $12.7 billion in carryover funding rather than requesting new discretionary appropriations. If VA's unobligated balance at the end of FY24 is less than projected, we are concerned about a potential funding shortfall next year. Lastly, we believe that the greatest roadblock to properly funding veterans' benefits and services comes from budgetary enforcement mechanisms designed to limit federal funding. To ensure our nation meets its sacred obligations, to America's veterans, the IBVSOs call on Congress to exempt veterans programs, services, and benefits from congressional paygo, as well as work to eliminate the use of CRs for VA care. Mr. Chairman, this concludes our testimony. My DAV and PVA colleagues and I will be pleased to answer any questions you or members of the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Uh, the written statements of all three witnesses will be entered into the record, and we will now proceed to questions. Mr. Murray, uh, I spoke 
earlier about the VA attorney who made the terrible anti-Semitic comments. Uh, the VA Office of General Counsel is requesting a, a significant budget increase. And what is your view of how VA has handled the situation with this attorney, and what do you think the office, office's priorities should be in dealing with this? So, uh, you know, obviously anything anti-Semitic is terrible. Uh, that is, needs to be flatly stated. Uh, Office of General Counsel needs a lot of resources. They are under-resourced right now. They're still working in paper-based systems. They are understaffed. In fact, uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the claim sharks and unaccredited folks, but they're not even, we believe, enforcing the laws for the actual accredited people right now, the rules and laws that they already have. Uh, for example, there are accredited attorneys who are violating the law, and all they are doing is receiving demand letters telling them to stop. They can do a better job. We don't believe uh, they're prioritizing that. We hope more people and more resources will take care of that so that accredited attorneys and agents who are already breaking existing laws are held to account. Okay, my next question is gonna be real difficult for each one of you to answer, but I'm, I know in your job you're going to Say nothing, probably, but let me ask you anyway. Uh, Mr. Murray and all three of you, the VA budget is approaching 400 billion. What wasteful and ineffective programs would you cut? And how and why would you do that? I know that's not really, like I said, within your, your, your you know, but we're trying to know that everything that we're doing is efficient and truly helping the veterans. And when, the, when an agency is the second largest bureaucracy in the world, it's in there somewhere. Sure, so uh, there, there's ways to be more efficient with your spending. I don't know necessarily about cutting, but if we spend more money appropriately, we'll save money in the long term. For example, paper-based systems. That takes a lot of man hours. That takes a lot of resources. We need to modernize. It has an upfront cost to some of those things, much like the EHR does, right. uh, but also infrastructure. If we spend appropriately now, it's gonna save us less money or more money in the future. Uh, having to eliminate wasteful repairs, maintenance, things like that on old systems just to keep them limping along instead of spending the proper money to build efficient modern systems. It's not necessarily a cut, but it's a better way to spend the money we do have. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, along with what Mr. Murray just said, I don't have a recommendation on a program to cut, but an idea for us to be more efficient specifically when we're talking about toxic exposures and presumptive diseases. We all know the PACT Act was monumental and will continue to be, but we also know it came with a very large cost. That's because we decided to wait 20, 30, 40 years before we take action on establishing presumptive diseases. There is a way we could do it faster, do it quicker. So if we can establish things up front, we're not gonna wait 20 or 30 years with such a larger cost to do something. Uh, DAV and MOA, we're gonna be putting out a report and a study uh, coming out in July to talk about all of these conditions and our recommendations on how to make this presumptive disease process work more efficient for veterans, the VA, and when it comes to spending. I don't have a recommendation either, but I believe the OIG has identified numerous opportunities for cost savings with regard to waste, fraud, and abuse, and VA has not lived up to those recommendations. So I would recommend that Congress hold VAs accountable in regard to the OIG reports as it regards to waste, fraud, and abuse, and ensure that they uh, take corrective actions to eliminate those uh, where they're wasting money due to fraud and abuse. Thank you. You know, I, I'm going to continue down this path because I, I have to believe, and, and we're monitoring this, and matter of fact, Mr. Self is, himself has jumped into it as well, um, that when we are looking at many of the programs we're wanting to do after the PACT Act, many of our bills we're wanting to move, somewhere sometime there has to have been some program that was passed that has either been ineffective or wore out its effectiveness of possible treatments, programs, whatever. And I know, like I said, you, you want to see the expansion, but we want to see that 
to make sure that the things that we're investing in are those that do what they were promised to do when we passed the legislation, whether it was b while we've been here or those that came before us to try to straighten it out. And any suggestions you might have at a, late, at, at, at a later time. My Mr. time is Mr. Chairman, if you look at some programs that were obviously well-intentioned at the time, like the VRAP program, the Veterans Rapid Retraining Assistance Program, right, um, that was built up for COVID, uh, uh, putting people back to work post or during COVID. Um, things like that uh, were well-intentioned, didn't exactly pan out. If we look at uh, things like the GI Bill restoration that was part of the Forever GI Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of money that was set aside for that. It didn't live up to the numbers that we thought it might have. So there are ways to look at things we've done over the years where we might have overestimated or gone uh, and, and you know, worked off of CBO scores that may not have been right. uh, totally accurate over time. Uh, Blue Water Navy is another example. There were massive estimations about who that's going to help, how many people. It was not nearly as much. So there are places to look at that. We'd be more than happy to, okay. to chat I with you. Appreciate that help. That. Representative Deluzio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And echo your good concern about the public expects us to get the best bang for the buck of taking care of our fellow veterans. So never be shy, please, with ways that VA can do better. Uh, gentlemen, the independent budget recommended $36.8 billion in overall funding for fee-for-service community care for fiscal year 2025. It turns out to be about $4 billion less than what VA itself is expecting to obligate for that care uh, next fiscal year. What are your thoughts about VA's proposal to transfer seven-plus billion from direct care, medical services uh, account, to the fee-for-service community care account this in fiscal year 2025? And relatedly, do you have concerns about the effect this will have or may have on VA medical facilities and VA's ability to provide direct care uh, to our veterans. Uh, Mr. Deluzio, we, we do have concerns about that. Uh, as you mentioned, some of the statistics in your statement, uh, it's some of the trends that we're, we're looking at. That's why uh, making VA care as the primary provider of care the first thing we think is important because of all the success metrics we've seen, but we can't do that without the people to provide the care and the yeah. up-to-date, safe buildings to do that in. So that's why, uh, to the uh, chairman's point about you know, fraud, waste, and abuse, we think we want to focus more on efficiency. If we get those things done in place, that there is a place to do that, we think that's going to save money in the long run. Very good. Um, anyone else on the panel, feel free. I'll, I'll just say the staffing reductions that VA is talking about reducing staffing. Uh, they wouldn't have to reduce staffing if they can find ways to lessen community care uh, out in the community. They shouldn't be reducing staffing. They should be building the staffing levels to ensure that uh, institutional care or VA care, uh, they have the resources to provide that care to our nation veterans. And thank you, just real quick. We're always concerned about if VA is not the primary care provider, is there going to be a good coordination of that care, especially when we start talking about medications and what they refer to as polypharmacy. A lot of veterans can get multiple medications from multiple sources within VA or in the community care, and nobody is watching what that negative synergistic effect is gonna have on their care. So that's why we really believe VA being the primary care provider and coordinating it is the best interest for veterans. Well, I, I appreciate that point on care coordination in particular. We've had some oversight about that and I've asked questions of, it's very inconsistent and very sporadic about what providers outside of VA are doing in terms of getting records back into VA, uh, what veterans can see about their care. And uh, certainly VA can do better and we're gonna push VA to do better on care coordination, but it seems like the Wild West and some providers I'm sure do well, Seems like others don't, and so I appreciate that point. Uh, with what little time I have left, transitional housing. So those providers are routinely contacting this committee to discuss resources they need to serve aging veterans or those with disabilities and their care. Would HR 491, uh, the Return to Home to Housing Act, provide more resources for GPD providers, and what kind of resources do those providers need to better be able to serve the aging and disabled homeless population? Uh, Mr. Luzio, passing the HOME Act would go a great way in 
um, accomplishing that mission. Uh, GPD payments, uh, we believe they need to be upheld to the, the rate that they're in that bill. Uh, it does cost a lot um, to accomplish that mission. So uh, putting that bill forward, getting that done in the veterans package, I know that is being threatened to be dropped for months, but we want that to uh, come to fruition. Very good. Gentlemen, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Representative easy for me to say this late in the day. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. And thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Uh, my, my first question here is for Mr. Um, Lyerman. Thank you. Uh, the, the VA budget proposes to cut VR&E staff. And um, as I've been talking about here in the bid, I introduced legislation this week, the Vets Opportunity Act which would expand the educational opportunities available to veterans and skilled trade programs. Do you perceive there to be an issue with the vr &E cuts, uh, the staff cuts, and the VA's ability to connect our most deserving veterans with career and education opportunities? Absolutely. Uh, over the last year, and thank you for the question, there was a 40% increase in applications for vr &E, and a lot of that is because of the PACT Act, more veterans are eligible. Any change to that is going to have a negative impact on veterans trying to complete their programs. Any way that we can find that will assist them in transitioning and most importantly, overcoming their own service-connected disabilities to find gainful employment is where we should always be focused. Thank you, thank you. And, and may, maybe you know this, I um, represent the southeastern part of Arizona. This is uh, over 70,000 veterans are in my district and um, to one military base, one military installation, DM Air Force Base in Fort Huachuca. So, and especially in the Cochise County area where Fort Huachuca is, um, the veteran population is, is a, a strong and big percentage of the population there. So this is, this is very important to my constituents. So, so um, I wanna make sure that those services are there and available. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Murray, uh, it, it's a goal of mine to ensure that veterans have the option to receive care conveniently as close to home if they have the ability. We've heard from veterans in my district as well as some VA staff that there's confusion among veterans when it comes to their community care appointments. Uh, specifically, there are, they are sometimes unsure who their points of contact are scheduling appointments and follow-ups, especially in light of the VA's proposal to cut community care by quite frankly, an astounding $10 billion. Do you have suggestions on how the VA can um, better be allocating resources to go towards outreach and education to veterans regarding the utilization of community care? I, I gave Cochise County as an example. This is one of the main areas where I hear this from, uh, more on the outside rural areas where there's confusion where they have to travel to get care. So this is, again, very important to my, to my district. Would you mind commenting on that? Absolutely, sir. So, uh uh, I've experienced this myself personally. Uh, some members of my family have experienced some of the, the confusion about coordinating community care. Uh, I think that you know, picking up the phone and having to call around and speak to the right person, get transferred, wait on hold, speak to the right person. Yeah, exactly. Trans it's, it is very difficult. Uh, we can do better with technology. Uh, I know that apps might not be the, the most preferred thing for a lot of folks, but it will help streamline things if we get things online. Uh, appointments, um, the ability to track and schedule, things like that, so you can see that in real time, right from your phone. We can get better at uh, informing our veterans about their care and their appointments, what is available, and then also places for them to follow up so there's not spending the better part of a morning on the phone uh, waiting on hold. Yeah, and I, and I do agree that obviously technology is always gonna be more cost effective and, and uh, we, we want our federal agencies and departments to be conscious of those expenses and be put in the right place. At the same time, I don't think any effort is too big to be able to reach our veterans as well. Some would prefer the app or technology. Some will prefer, um, depending on their comfort level, to speak to a person. And I, I understand the staffing challenges on that, but I also appreciate the, the priority placed on making sure that every veteran is met where they are. Uh, both in their comfort level on communication, but many times physically as well, and making sure that we have these resources and services where they live without having to, to go to a great extent to travel and get there. 
and even more so when they already don't have the services locally, but it's hard to get a hold of someone, that, that makes it even more difficult. I've had uh, cases where just a simple question, this, is a, this wasn't for care to, to go visit someone, but the preference of a question, they had to travel to feeling that they had a better shot at someone hearing them if they were there in person. I, I don't like to hear that. Uh, I don't think any of us like to hear that. So I, I just challenge you to, to address this issue as well and, and make sure that we meet veterans where they are, both physically, but also in their comfort level to communicate. Completely agree. Thank you, sir. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So I want to say a thank you again for staying around and, and being drawn, had the day drawn out like it did. But I'm dealing with these issues, and we are, and I'm very concerned that the VA seems to be struggling to manage its budget. Congress uh, has also provided um, the resources VA requested, and I'm committed to prioritizing our veterans and that's from our Republican side of the aisle, regardless of what might have been said in opening comments, and you all know that. I believe both Republicans and Democrats are trying to do the best that we can to make this budget work for those people who have served us so well. But the budget gimmicks that seem that, that the VA is using are becoming more and more complicated, and I think they're seeing some of it backfire on them. VA is the only organization I know of where a 10% budget increase can result in a shortfall. Doesn't happen in your house. I just, I just don't see it. But it doesn't add up. But I want to assure you and the veterans and VA employees watching this hearing that we will continue to work with the department to straighten this mess out. We're going to preserve the health care and benefits that veterans depend on and the other services that VA provides. We're going to make sure that employees are treated fairly. And I think we can best accomplish that by simplifying the budget. With that, I ask unanimous consent that all members shall have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include any extenuous material. Hearing no objection, so ordered. This hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>